All right, I hope that during the break you come up with some solutions to this problem. Um, first of all, I will not give you a golden answer today. But I just want to go through the thinking process uh, to solve this problem. The goal is to build a 64 kilobyte of memory region. So the first question you want to ask is, how many such 2764 EEPROM chips you need to build a memory region of 64K bytes? So you can easily do the math, right? You divide 64K bytes by 4K bytes. So you know that you're going to need 16 of these chips. The other thing you want to consider is um, when you have 64, I mean 16 of these chips, and each of them has 8 bit output, how are you going to connect these 16 chips? to your data bus, which is also 8-bit. So this is the data bus. And if you imagine this is a 2764 that EEPROM chip will use, you will together have, all together have 16 of them. And each of them will have data bus, data output. And all these output will be tied together on that common data bus. Whenever you have multiple chips connected onto the data bus, you have to think about very carefully how do you make sure that only one of them will be active, will be selected. Because no more than one chip can talk at the same time. Right? That's the key. So you have to make sure that the way you supply the control signals to the chip, typically the chip select or output enable, has to be carefully controlled by the decoder, by your address. So the, the key problem to solve in this design is to design the decoder circuit so that by the given address inputs, only one of these N memory chips is selected, is active. Okay. There are many different ways to do this decoder design. If you combine the decoder with some other logic gates, you have different kinds of designs. Many will work, but the key is to make sure that no more than one of these chips that are connected to the same data bus can work or can be activated at any given time. And I encourage you to really derive the solution on your own and work on this problem uh, after class. Yes. Oh, this is the number I expect you to come up. So the question is 2 to the power of x equals this 4k. No, it's 12, right? All right, I'm going to spend the next few a couple of slides to uh, say a few more words about DRAM. Dynamic RAM, the benefits of using DRAM is because DRAM has higher density than static RAM. <coughs> By higher density, we mean that for a given chip, it has a lot more data bits uh, stored in that chip than a D SRAM chip. It's because the way information or bit is stored differently uh, in SRAM and DRAM. SRAM use six um, transistors and DRAM use only one. And as a result, 
DRAM is less expensive than SRAM uh, for storing the same amount of data bits. And because the density is high, it requires address multiplexing. We explained this uh, a few minutes earlier. The idea is to break long address into row and column, usually uh, half of the original number of bits. DRAM requires refreshing because internal capacitors that stores information will lose charge over a period of time. So we need to have a special uh, refreshing cycle to recharge these cells so that the DRAM can return the information. Any read or write will automatically refresh a section of the chip. And, but you will need a special refresh cycle to re make sure that the whole chip still has the, um, stores the information that it needs to restore, to store. And DRAM chips often works with DRAM controllers because the control is a lot more involved than the uh, simple SRAM chip. This is the internal structure of the DRAM. Uh, one example, this is the 256K by one DRAM. That is to say each location is a one bit and it has 256K locations. That is to say it has uh, 18 bit um, as the address. As a result, you see because of the address multiplexing it needs only nine bits for the address, together with this row address strobe and the column address strobe, it will um, input the row address and the column address into this row latch and column latch. You can imagine that these information, these bits are organized in uh, matrix. So the row latch actually stores the old address that will be used to um, select one of these rows. And the column address stored in the column latch will be used to select one of the columns. So altogether, these two will be able to locate any individual bit or cell in that matrix and then output um, to the output pins. DRAM chips often use refresh counters uh, to supply refresh address. And counter size is determined by the types of DRAM. And after every refresh cycle, the counter is incremented. Here's a simple example. Um, for a DRAM with 256 rows, it has to finish refreshing every single row in four milliseconds in order to retain the information. So that is to say, for every row, you essentially spend about a little bit over 15 microseconds for the refreshing operation. Assume that you use this chip with a five megahertz microprocessor. And this five megahertz microprocessor will perform um, 800 nanosecond per read. So every read operation coming out of this memory, I mean coming out of this microprocessor will need 800 nanosecond to complete. Okay, this is the time determined by the microprocessor. In fact, if you remember the um, architecture of this microprocessor, the way it operates that is that it spent four cycles, four CPU cycles to complete a memory cycle, a memory read. So if you do the math, this five um, megahertz, the cycle time of the processor is 200 nanosecond, and four cycles, that gives you 800 nanosecond to perform a read operation from the microprocessor. Um, so every, about 19 memory read or write operations 
the memory needs to run a refresh cycle. Okay, that is to use this 15.6 divided by uh, 800 nanosecond. So in that estimation is about 5% performance loss for this microprocessor. This is because every 18 memory operations, you need to then wait for the refresh of the DRAM to complete. So one out of 20 is have the time as um, you have to wait for that time out of one of 20. So about 5% performance loss. We said earlier that uh, for DRAM, SDRAM or DDR DRAM, or, uh, they often use together with the controllers, DRAM controllers. DRAM controllers can do a number of different things to optimize the performance of DRAM read. Uh, one example is the burst read. In a burst read operation, the DRAM controller will read the first 64-bit um, as the same speed as a st standard DRAM. Um, typically four bus cycles uh, with a weight state. For the falling accesses, okay, the second, third, and fourth 64-bit operations, you can finish those operations, the read operations, in one bus cycle at a time. So altogether, uh, you will need seven bus cycles for four 64-bit numbers. If we do not have this burst read, okay, then in a standard DRAM operation, you will need 12 bus cycles. For DDR, which stands for uh, double data rate, the optimization here is the data transfer is um, happening on each edge of the clock. So not only in the rising edge, but also in the um, lowering edge of the clock. As a result, the data transfer rate is doubled, but still the uh, access time is um, constant because you spend the same amount of time doing the row access and column access. DRAM controller, in general, will be charged to handle this address multiplexing because it has to take the full-fledged n number of address bits from the microprocessor, then divide that into two halves and generate this row address control strobe and column address strobe control signals. So that splitting the address control signal generation is handled by this DRAM controller. And DRAM controller is often built into the microprocessors or some um, I.O. chipset, control chipset. At the end of this lecture, uh, I list some of the quiz questions. These questions come from the textbook. Um, I encourage you to look at those questions here. And also, I encourage you to look at the homework or exercise questions at the end of the chapter. This is chapter 10 of the textbook. Um, make sure that you can answer some of the questions that we talked about in this class.